This is the On the Pony Express podcast. Part of the On3 network. Check out all the SMU coverage you need at ontheponyexpress.com. Now, now. here's your host, Billy Embody. Billy Embody. One, two, three. Let's go. Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. I am Billy Embody. Thanks for listening. We've got a fun show for you today as we'll talk a lot of SMU spring ball. And we'll also visit with Andy Staples of On3, our national team, one of our reporters who's covered college football for many, many years at various publications and has done a great job for years. So excited to chat with Andy about the ACC, about SMU, changing landscape of college football, all of those things. And we'll get to that in just a few minutes. But first, we are presented by Status Jet. Statusjet.com. You can head over there to find all the information you want on what David Henry and his team can do for you when it comes to your charter jet experience. And we trust them. SMU Athletics trusts them. They're a proud supporter of SMU. And we partnered with them because we needed to get the word out that you guys can find other options in the private jet space that will really take care of every single detail for you as you get from point A to point B, whether big jet, small jet, helicopter, or whether you want to buy or sell a plane, David Henry and his team can help you do that. And they've got contacts all over the world to make sure that wherever you are, they can get you taken care of. And so that's why we really partnered with them is that they have that attention to detail. They want to share that with you guys um, and many other SMU fans as well. And so we'll be working with them on our experiences this fall as we get SMU fans from Dallas to some of the ACC games that SMU does have on the schedule. We're excited to share plans about those, so stay tuned for that. But head to statusjet.com, read up on them, give them a call, and use code PONYUPACC or mention on the PonyExpress.com for a discount on a round-trip flight. So appreciate Status Jet for all they do for us. Welcome back to the On the Pony Express podcast. I'm happy to be joined by Andy Staples of On3, one of our national reporters. And he's got his own podcast, The Andy Staples Show, so we can have you guys check that out and subscribe to that wherever you check out your podcasts as well. Good listen, as always. Andy, welcome in. Thanks for doing this. Well, thank you, Billy. I appreciate it. Well, we've got uh, two guys here who have lived in Tampa. Uh, You used to work for the Tampa Trib. You've bounced all over. You've been a national guy for a long time. Uh, let's lead off with this. And I know we talked before about what we were going to talk about, and I, I didn't mention this, but what's your 50,000 foot view of where college football is uh, with your, all your experience and wisdom that that you've gained? Uh, how do you see this sport right now uh, as it's It's in a period of, of massive upheaval. You know, you've had these these various changes be either forced on them by a state legislature or forced on them by the court system uh, happening because the schools and the NCAA have been pretty unwilling to, to be flexible about anything. And uh, they pretty much have, uh, have proven the old maxim, the, the pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. They're in the, in the process of getting slaughtered over and over again. And eventually a new way to, organize and govern college football will emerge from all this, but there's going to be some very messy parts in the middle, which is probably, I I think Cal Stanford and SMU and the ACC is one of those messy parts. And let's dive into that piece. When you watch the ACC expand and they do bring in Cal Stanford and SMU, what did you make of that move? And if you want to maybe dive into each of the schools and maybe how you feel about them, you know, heading into that league and, and their fit. Well, what I've made, what I make of that move is pretty simple. They backfilled in case they lost Clemson, North Carolina, and Florida State. And they would have the same number of members if they lost those three. And that's what made the most sense. Otherwise, why would it make sense that you would take two schools from California? Like the SMU move actually makes more sense than anything else, especially with SMU going, hey, you don't have to give us any money. We got lots of money already. So that's that part made the most sense. The the part of taking Cal now, knowing how some of these schools operate, knowing that they want to be associated with other very elite academic institutions, I do understand why they'd want to be associated with Cal and Stanford. 
And honestly, look, at the, the Big Ten is a coast-to-coast -coast league. What's the difference? I mean, the only thing is the name is misleading, but the Big Ten doesn't have 10 members. So uh, if, if having a misleading name is a crime, then everybody goes to jail in this situation. So uh, I think I think that was the the main thrust of it is, is the deal that the ACC has with, with ESPN. They have to keep 15 members, including Notre Dame. And so if they do that, then they're going to keep 15 members because those are the three you're worried about leaving. They could always backfill later if they, they worry about somebody else. But and, and and Florida State's not leaving right now. Like that'll all get worked out. And I, I firmly believe that there will be a settlement. There, there will be a dollar figure that is less than 500 something million that Florida State will pay to get out of the ACC. But we don't know when that's going to be. There's going to be a lot of legal wrangling before that because the ACC is going to try to exhaust every potential option before it comes down to actually negotiating with Florida State, coming up with a number everybody can live with. The problem is once you negotiate with Florida State, you have to negotiate with North Carolina, with Clemson, or with anybody else who might want to do anything. I don't know that that number is particularly high because I don't know like that the SEC or the Big Ten would just snap anybody else up. But I do know that if those if those three were to get free, then it would there'd probably be a home for them. Let me let me toss this out there to you just because everybody always thinks about the SEC and the Big Ten expanding further. And and obviously with Oregon and Washington, that that move with the Big Ten wasn't necessarily expected until it happened. Uh, but could the ACC go on the offensive and nab a Big 12 school or two and that make the deal better that Florida State? What's, what's or, the incentive for the Big 12 school to move? I, I'm not sure. There's no more money. Yeah. So it, it, why? Which, which which one seems more stable right now? Which one has somebody suing it right now? Well, there there is that. There is that. <laughs> I, I think I think Brett Yormark has has assembled quite a group of schools that just doesn't do anything for you from the next TV deal, if that makes sense. Well, but, but here's the thing: they're all alike. The yeah. the ACC's problem is they're not all alike. Yeah, Florida State and Boston College are very different, yeah. and that is is in itself a problem. Like the Big Twelve, there's a ce a definite ceiling on it, but you're also not going to have a situation where somebody's like, "Hey, we're so much more desirable than everybody else. We're getting the hell out of here." Like you don't have to worry about that now. There you go. Always dropping the knowledge. Um, when when you look at SMU going into the ACC. What do you see from a program standpoint, just a football team that's going to try to make some waves, uh, at least in year one, and, and then go from there? Well, I look at that schedule, and I'm like, whoo, this could get real interesting year one for SMU. Because, you know, you look at what they bring back. You look what they got out of the transfer portal. You know, Rhett Lashley's done a really good job there. Other than the Florida State game and at Louisville, I think they'd be favored in most of those games. So if you can win one of the two, the Florida State or the Louisville game, like, are we that crazy thinking about SMU in the ACC championship game? I don't think it's that crazy. Yeah, I, I, I've said that, and it's nice to at least, you know, somebody from the outside, not around the program every day to, to hear that because it is, I've, I think I said this on a podcast a couple of weeks ago, I could see SMU going ten and two, and you know, being able to notch wins over BYU and TCU, and and win the rest of the ACC games, not name Florida State and Louisville. And then I could see a world where it's a meat grinder of a schedule, jumping up. They go six and six, and you know, you see a little bit of promise. You make a bowl game, but it's not, you know, as easy a jump as as it ended up. You know, potentially. Well, I I think you look at the teams that moved into the Big Twelve last year as kind of a litmus test. Like UCF was in most of those games. There was the, they got blown out by Kansas, but every every other game they were really in. But they ended up six and seven. And if the ball bounces differently, they could have ended up nine and three, and could have ended up maybe in the Big Twelve championship game. And so I think the question the question really is how much of a meat grinder will it be? And the thing is, when you look at having Boston College, Virginia, Cal, Pittsburgh, Stanford, Louisville, it is harder than the American. It is tougher than the American. 
I'm not sure it's that much tougher. I'm not sure it's like what UCF moved into where like, again, with the big 12, all of those teams are kind of the same level and that level's pretty good. The ACC, there's a lot wider variability. Now, the problem is like, if Pitt bounces back, like Pitt was terrible last year. Pitt's usually pretty good. Like right. you get the right version of Pitt, the, they can come in there and, and beat you. Uh, we'll see what happens with Bill O'Brien at, at Boston College, but their uh, their young quarterback is fun to watch. You know, the, so you found they that. got two games in a row, BC and Virginia, where they're going to play against young quarterbacks. Uh, Castellanos is, is the one at Boston College, and I believe uh, Calandria is the one at, at, at Virginia, and they're they're so much fun to watch. But there's also a lot of like, no, 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 no. Yes, yes, yes. No, 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 no. Please don't throw that. <laughs> so it's one of those like boom or bust kind of things. So if, if they wind up having the greatest game of their lives against SMU, that's a game they can win. But then if they also decide to go a little crazy, try to try to put the team on their back, SMU might be able to force some turnovers, you know, take care of things on defense. But really, it's interesting how it all it, it's that because the TCU thing, the BYU thing, those are non-conference games. Like they don't affect whether SMU is going to make the ACC title game. But going into ACC play, the first two games, if they can split the first two games, they get Florida State at home. They're at Louisville. Florida State Louisville might be your ACC title game. We don't know where Clemson's going to be. We don't know where Miami is going to be. I think those are the other two that you're probably seriously considering for the ACC title game this year. But like Louisville is going to be very talented. They were good last year. They ruled the transfer portal, maybe with the exception of Ole Miss. I think Ole Miss might have done a little bit better, but Louisville was awesome in the transfer portal this year. And you, you just, it really kind of depends on Tyler Shook, how well he adjusts to Jeff Brom's offense and can he stay healthy because he's never been able to stay healthy. And then Florida State. They went 13 and 0. They won the ACC last year. This will be a completely different team, but that doesn't mean it's going to be a bad team because DJ Uyungle comes in. He's obviously very experienced in these big games. I think he's a better quarterback after that year at Oregon State. And then you look at what they did in the portal, whereas that before they would go get they get good guys from like South Carolina. Uh, they got some guys from Mississippi State in the past. Like this is they, they went and said, we're taking from Alabama and Georgia. We're taking the guys who are backups who might be starters next year, but aren't sure if they're going to be starters next year. We're going to take them. They're going to start here. And so will Florida State still be the most talented team in the league? I think them, Clemson, Miami will will duke it out for that title. Yeah, when you look at the ACC, it's always – it's interesting, in particular last year, you know, one team that I I don't think gets enough credit, NC State at times, I think they yep. either finished, well, I guess they finished third in the league um, this past they're, year. They're always good for eight or nine wins, yeah. and they're always good for a loss that makes you go, what in the hell were they doing? And they tend to schedule in a way that makes sure they have eight or nine wins. And and that's and that's where, as, as SMU fans start to look at the ACC and what to make of it, what do you make of this league where you do have FSU Louisville who can be out on top last year? You've got NC State who's in play. Georgia Tech made some noise. And then you've got Miami that's just kind of probably at least the Texas A&M of the, of the league where they the expectations good are Good comparison. <laughs> I think it's a very good comparison. <laughs> Even though yeah, they I think Texas A&M last year. What are you gonna yeah. make of how how wide of a range? I think Clemson was fifth in the league last year. You can there's just such a wide range of where some really proud programs can land. Yeah, and the question is, is Clemson bounce back this year? Because they were certainly on the upswing at the end of last year. And my thing with Clemson is if Dabo would just use the transfer portal a little, they would still be national title contenders every year because they would plug those those two or three holes they have. And they'd be fine, but they don't do that. So they're vulnerable. That makes them vulnerable to your Miamis, to your Florida States, to your NC States who beat them last year. You know, that that's that's the issue. So I don't know. I, I think it's I think it's a it's also the other piece of this is the the schedule draw. And I've been trying to explain this to fans in the SEC and the Big Ten who have not seen this before because they've been playing divisional schedules. The ACC started this last year, and we saw it with Louisville. Louisville last year 
was the beneficiary of a very good schedule draw. And then they also beat Notre Dame in a game that doesn't count in the ACC standings. But like, let's go to Louisville's schedule this year. It does not favor them. Like, they, they got to play Miami. They got to play at Clemson. You know, they, they're, it's not going to be as easy. They get Notre Dame again, but they've got to go to South Bend this year. Like, it's, it's not as easy as it was last year. So I think what you draw also affects you. I think Florida State's schedule draws pretty hard. I think they got one of the tougher ones. If if look if if Noah had the chance to bring transfers onto the ark they they would have and and so I mean <laughs> now just two of every mean, animal Billy two yeah, of everyone that's right that, well, yeah two on each side of the ball I guess um, do do you do you have a a pick for who's going to win the ACC this year it sounds like Florida State might be at the top of your list you, it, I I think just because I have faith in Mike Norvell but I I don't have a lot of faith in that. Because I don't, uh, again, that team's going to be so different this year, and I don't know what they're going to be, and I do think they have one of the harder schedules in the league. I, I think Louisville might be my other one. And I realize that you're, you're just piggybacking on last year. This Louisville team's going to be different. I actually like this Louisville team coming into the year much better than I like last year's. I think last year, they caught some breaks. They benefited from a, a, a good schedule. This year, I think they're just going to be good enough to win these games. Does Miami break through? Is it, is it, they've got oh, know, such a great question, Billy. Like that quarterback now. Yeah, well, they've got Cam Ward, which I'm not sure is the the cure all that everybody thinks it is. But they they should be better on the offensive line. They should be better on the defensive line. You know, they they lost some they lost some firepower at receiver. Like they lost uh, Colby Young to Georgia, but Xavier Restrepo is still there. Like they've got some dudes on that team that Miami should be in the ACC title game. Make no mistake. Like all other things equal, Miami should be in the ACC title game, but I need to see it. I need to see it from Mario Cristobal on the field. You know, we saw the Georgia tech game last year. That, that was insane. Like, how do you not take a knee there? And so you've got that. And you've also, like you mentioned, NC state's always going to be a tough out. I think Brent key has made Georgia tech, a very tough out. I think they they are a team that nobody wants to play anymore. Um, I just think that that one that one's going to be a trickier game for for most teams than you realize. And I, like I, I said, you know, I was looking at Louisville's schedule. They get Georgia Tech at home in their ACC opener. Like that's that's no gimme. Yeah, I I, I think this league is it's a little bit. It, it's just so all over the place. And to your to your point about the how they don't play divisions it's just the draw and and well and, and like what's Syracuse going to look like with Fran Brown coaching them now because he had some some talent yeah he went he went right into the transfer portal and upgraded their talent significantly so what does that mean we've never seen him as a head coach before he's he's been a position coach like what does that look like it could look really good so that's the other part of it is there are some mysteries in there some unknowns that are going to make this season really interesting. The ACC. Let's kind of wrap a little bit on on this. The the national landscape in college football, as far as who can be the top teams. Probably you're looking at some of the familiar names up there. But how much does the change changing of the guard at Alabama and Michigan and all of those things does that shake up how you view who are the true college football playoff contenders? How what's kind of your early feel for next year's Top top of the top for college football. We had a question on my show that I thought was really interesting. They asked the, the, it was a listener asked, "Can you do you do you feel comfortable naming fifteen teams and thinking you got all eleven power conference participants in the college football playoff correct?" And my answer to that was no. I think the number is more like twenty five. Like and now obviously. Those aren't all teams I think would win if they got in. But I think last year was a great example. How many people going into the season thought Washington would have a chance to play for the national title? And you can say, oh, all Washington had to do was win that one game against. No, they had to beat Oregon twice. Then they had to beat Texas. So like that Washington team in a 12-team playoff, let's say they, they did the same thing, went through the ACC. They could have won two games and gotten to the national title game. Like they absolutely could have. So... 
I think the transfer portal has changed and not like NIL is p- part of it, but I think the transfer rules changing are a bigger part of it. It's just made the, the allocation of talent more efficient in college football. So you don't have these teams that are so much more talented than everyone else. Like Georgia and Ohio state are the two most talented teams going into this season. Georgia was probably the most talented team last season. Georgia lost the SEC championship game because they didn't have enough depth at receiver and some guys were hurt. Yeah. Well, guess what? That's something that can happen to everybody down the line. Now, in a season like this one, Georgia still makes the playoff. Maybe Georgia still wins the national title or maybe being thin at receiver bites them in the butt again in the playoff when they play a team that's a little bit healthier. That's that's the thing. I think now you, you've got so much more variability and more teams that actually have a real chance because there are no perfect super teams where everybody's got, or not everybody, but these two teams or these three teams have everything they need and they're top to bottom deep and nobody else is. That's just not the case because like I was talking about Florida State earlier, Florida State was picking off the depth that used to make Alabama and, and Georgia unstoppable. And does that make Florida State a national title contender? We'll see, but it certainly makes them better and it certainly makes Alabama and Georgia worse if they have a couple injuries. Well, I guess now we get to hold your feet to the fire here. Does SMU make the college football playoff in year one? Ooh, probably should have made it last year, right? Yeah. yeah. Or, well, New Year's Six Bowl, which would have put them in the college football yeah, playoff in this yeah. scenario. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. I don't think so. Non-serious. But like I said, yeah. but they've got playing yeah. in the ACC championship game. And think about this, Billy. Think about this. So let's say they make the ACC championship game. You're playing for a buy at that point. Like you're gar- if you win, you're guaranteed to get in and you're probably getting a buy. Like the only way you're not getting a buy is if somehow the highest ranked group of five champ is ranked higher than you. But that's crazy. You could be playing for the three or the four seed if SMU were to get into the into the ACC championship game. And that is again looking at the schedule. Looking at the rosters, a very real possibility. You got to split Florida State and Louisville. Go one and one there, and it's a very real possibility. There we go. SMU fans, get get your tickets now. Uh, you should, <laughs> hey, swing into Dallas. It's lovely in December. We, we will get you taken care of uh, when F- F- FSU comes to Dallas. We'll do some barbecue. Get on to, to open up the 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 budget. Isn't I'm trying. To, let's see. September. Isn't the same? Isn't that, is that the same day? No, it's not the same day as uh as Texas and Oklahoma. I think it's a week before. Oh, oh, no, thank God. Oh, man. Maybe just spend the whole week in Dallas. Just yeah. go for that game. Yeah. And spend the whole week, and I can go to Norman, and I can go to Austin, and yeah, there you yeah. go. I like the way you think. I'm a planner. I'm a planner. It's March and we've got your trip lined up. We'll have food, food destinations picnics. So, <laughs> all right, Andy Staples, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. We'll have you back on and uh, hope you guys enjoyed this interview with Andy. And Andy, thanks so much for the time. Enjoy the weekend. My pleasure, Billy. Thank you. Welcome back to the On the Pony Express podcast. Appreciate Andy for jumping on with us. He's one of my favorite guys to read. So if you're looking for more of Andy's articles, just head to on3.com. You can also catch his show, the Andy Staples show at on3, and he does a really good job covering everything, uh, really from a national angle um, when it comes to college football and the landscape. He has some interesting interviews on uh, just about every episode. So appreciate Andy. Uh, He also used to work for the Tampa Tribune, my hometown newspaper that's now defunct. So um, we have that tie. We have the Tampa ties. So Pretty interesting stuff from him. Obviously, the landscape of college football and conference realignment, not done shifting without a doubt. But, and I'm kind of glad it ended this way, he's got an opinion that SMU has a real chance to make the ACC championship. And look, it isn't outlandish. I mean, I've said it, but hearing it from a national guy, you kind of feel a little bit more like, okay, all right, at least, you know, some people could see that happening. Things have to go their way. They have to, you know, obviously split uh, an FSU Louisville. But 
I'm still of the opinion that SMU can go anywhere from six and six to ten and two. I, I'm not sure they can get past an FSU and Louisville um, or Louisville and, and and split those, but um, that's just kind of a credit to where those programs are at, in my opinion, especially what Louisville did in the transfer portal, like Andy said. But a lot of good to take away from that when it comes to SMU, the football program, and where it's trending uh, heading into the ACC. So Andy uh, does a great job for us. Hope you guys enjoyed that interview. We're going to do more of that, especially now that SMU is you know, diving into a league where it is more nationally covered. It is fun for us to bring on national people, some of our beat writers from the other ACC schools, and and bring them on and, and talk a little bit more about the league and its direct direction, how SMU fits in, talk about the teams overall. And and so we'll be doing more of that. Uh, we've also got J.D. Pakel, We've got Josh Newberg. Uh, we've got plenty of other national guys as well as our team beat reporters that that will be bringing on the pod so excited about that uh as as the off season unfolds and we get to know the acc a little bit more that'll be a good piece for the podcast for you guys but let's end with a couple of recruiting notes as uh smu is continuing to set official visits for may that's really for the most part when we've seen official visits get locked in a couple June ones uh, that we'll be seeing, but we'll we'll talk about those at a later time. But right now, SMU sitting in the top 25 of the on three industry rankings when it comes to uh, the um, the the recruiting rankings. But they've got a chance to move up. They've got some prospects they're trending for, and they did just lock in a few more official visitors. We've seen Elijah Pratt, SMU's defensive back commit uh, from. IMG Academy by way of Arlington Mansfield Timberview lock in his official visit for May 17th. He'll be on campus. He is fresh off a commitment to SMU and he'll be there uh, for his May 17th official visit. And then they do have another SMU commit coming in that weekend. JV on holiday, the defensive back from Duncanville will be on campus. And that is shaping up to really be a monster recruiting weekend for SMU overall. And, and that's going to be one to really watch closely as, as they look to, uh, you know, land some of these top talents. But uh, the one that I'll, that I'll note, and I talked a little bit about some of the others on the subscriber only podcast. If you're not at on the ponyexpress.com subscribe for just a dollar and you can get that podcast, but a big name that just tweeted it out or put it on Instagram, Michael Turner, the top 100 running back for on three. We just moved him up into uh, the top 75. He's now the, fourth running back in the country. I'll get a chance to see Mike at the Under Armour Dallas camp on Sunday. So excited about that. He was just on SMU's campus for junior day. You see SMU does lead the on three RPM for him there if you're watching on YouTube. But that lead will only uh, strengthen, uh, I would say, when when I add in his official visit uh, for May 17th, May 17th. He'll be on campus. That'll be a week after Kyle Cooper will host four-star running back Ricky Stewart for an official visit. The former SMU commit did lock in that visit with the Mustangs. We'll see. That's a, that's a long way uh, to uh, that that time. Still, you know, what, two months, two solid months. But if he does remain uncommitted, he does plan to take that visit. He'll also be on campus uh, the May 10th weekend with Demetrius Brisbane, the former SMU commit. And now Baylor Pledge, they're they're going to be swinging through campus for official visits. You can track all the official visits at OnThePonyExpress.com. Head to the recruiting tab and go to the visits tab, and that's where they're all that's where they're at on uh, on the on the site there for you guys. And and we we update you guys as guys lock in official visits, and we're able to um, you know share them before maybe they get out there. So look for some of that scoop at OnThePonyExpress.com. Subscribe for just a dollar for your first month. We've had ton of people subscribe with spring ball and and looking for that SMU recruiting scoop. So hopefully uh, we'll see more of you guys on there talking SMU football as uh, spring ball takes a pause, at least now that they're on spring break. So let's wrap with that. A few thoughts as SMU heads into spring break. For me, I look at this team as far as some things that I that I picked up just out there on the field. And I feel a little bit better about this defensive line. And I think they're they're a group that when you see them in person, you really, you almost have had to have been out to practice in the spring last year when SMU had 
guys like Jordan Miller, guys like Elijah Roberts, and working alongside Elijah Chapman and Devere Levelston to understand really how big SMU now is in the defensive line room and, and what Calvin Thibodeau's brought in with guys like Tank Booker at 340-something pounds and Mike Lockhart at 308 or whatever he's he's listed at. And Jonathan Jefferson's a big dude. And they have Corey Roberson back. And Kevin Allen's taking steps forward. And Elijah Roberts, who's playing you know a defensive end spot, is looking like an absolute pro out there running through things with his ability to bend and, and do some pretty freaky athletic things. He had a pick six the other day in practice. And then you factor in that they don't have Blake Burris yet, who's a 6'5", 6'4", 300 and something pounder who's going to come in this summer from Texas Tech. And you know they're going to go after another defensive lineman in the transfer portal. So you could see them stack more size, more depth, more talent this spring portal window. And that's pretty scary to think about. And this defensive line room, I, I would say, has gotten the best of an offensive line that is down Ben Sparks, is down Logan Parr. They lost Marcus Bryant and Branson Hickman to the transfer portal. So the depth there is being a little tested this spring. And the second unit is, you know, second year players like Alex Woods at center, who's taking steps forward, as is Sean Scott at left tackle. But there's there's just a little bit of a difference right now in that group overall. And, and so I think SMU needs to continue to, you know, just address that in the transfer portal window. We'll see them go after another tackle. We'll see them do that. But uh, the starting offensive line looks a lot more athletic overall with Justin Osborne at center, Savion Bird at right tackle, P.J. Williams at left tackle. And again, they're missing Logan Parr, one of their best offensive linemen, but they brought in a Nate Anderson at left guard. Uh, they've got Ja'Kai Clark, who's moving a lot better since he's dropped some weight at right guard. It's been an interesting matchup. I just think when SMU rolls defensive linemen like they are right now, they can usually get the best of them. And we didn't even mention any of the edge rushers like Isaiah Smith, who's had a great spring, Cam Robertson, and then Jafar, uh, Jafar I. Harvey coming off the edge. Those guys can really go and they can make life difficult on the offensive line. So I think that that's the biggest thing is this defensive line is really in a good spot and they're not done adding to it. When you look at the team and maybe what you need to see when the spring unfolds and continues to, to kind of watch it play out is you really want to see the cornerback step up and they haven't been able to do that too much in practice. And they haven't had to because the defensive line has been really good. But when you see Deuce Harmon out there, He's probably the only guy, the Texas A&M transfer, who you feel pretty good about where things stand with and him being able to con contribute and play at a high level. But beyond that, Jalen Davis Robinson has been hurt. He hurt his hamstring. He's probably out until at least past spring uh, break. And then you get – you have Jah Jahari Rogers and you have um, Teddy Knox out there they need to continue to show something, and we just haven't seen them turn the corner just yet. But I'll say this about Teddy Knox. He has a ton of speed. If there is a guy that can go from, I think, Brandon Stevens in a way of this rise in progression, but very different players, body types, path to cornerback, all those things. But Teddy Knox has really shown some impressive speed, ability to break on the football, make plays. He's got that swagger. He's kind of bulked up a little bit. I mean, he's one of the fastest players on the team. It would really wouldn't shock me if he was the fastest. I mean, he, he can go. And so you add that speed and you have that natural ability because of that speed to be able to not be lost in coverage or get burned and things like that. It's a matter of him learning technique where the wide receiver room, it is a position that you see a lot of refinement in routes. You see a lot of receivers being able to set people up and make plays because they've refined their technique and their craft. And that's really what wide receiver is. And we've seen Jordan Hudson take steps forward in that craft. And we see some of the talent that SMU has at receiver. This, that, that group needs to take a step forward. 
in 2024 for SMU to do what Andy Staples kind of mentioned they could do, which is potentially land in the ACC championship game. But Jordan Hudson is taking a step forward. I think Romello Brinson is taking a step forward. It's kind of an interesting spring so far. It's really hard to take away certain things on the offense, kind of like last year in fall camp, because the defense has kind of gotten after the offense so much in terms of applying pressure. So need a corner to step up. It looks like if you're picking one just from an availability perspective, Teddy Knox is stepping up and doing some really good things. Jalen Davis Robinson, was that, that was the guy they were hoping, but he hurt his hamstring. They've got to be really careful with it, obviously, because you don't want it to linger into summer and then fall camp. And before you know it, he's week to week in the season with it. But he's somebody that can step up. They're going to address the cornerback room in all likelihood in the transfer portal as well. But I, I think this team has really showed a lot of, of the promise of what it can, it can be in 2024 if the bounces go their way, if they – come out ready to play, whereas early last season against an OU and TCU and even, I mean, East Carolina, in some of those early first half of the season games, SMU didn't come out kind of, or I, sh I should say, they didn't capitalize on opportunities. And against TCU, they really kind of didn't come out with it, with an overall good performance effort, kind of like they played hard, but it just wasn't, it wasn't there. Both games, they had opportunities to change the narrative around how we re retell those stories. But with this team having so many familiar faces, they have promise and they don't need the adjustment, on, at least on paper and theoretically, that they had last year where they needed to bring Preston Stone in as, as a start new starting quarterback. And they've got all these different receivers and they have new running backs. and it's just it was different and it took time to adjust and the defense played really well for the most part and if you go into next year and SMU can bring it on offense which they need to continue to improve they'll do that by getting healthier on the offensive line when they get guys back Jordan Hudson's continued development I like what they've got at running back with the different options Brashard Smith's been a nice addition and if you add more depth on and talent on the offensive line that'll help hold up over the course of the season it's a real question to to ask is Preston Stone the guy going into ACC play because Kevin Jennings has been really good at times in spring practice and he played well enough for SMU to win two pretty big football games last year to end the year that is something to watch I think SMU staff believes in Kevin Jennings they believe in Preston Stone but when you do get to four games in, what is it going to look like when it comes to the overall body of work? Who knows? We're just guessing here now and going into the season, but Kevin Jennings has, has shown some development and really shows a lot of promise. So I'm intrigued to see how that plays out the rest of spring. I mean, they've, they've only gone, I think, six practices. So they've got nine more to go, uh, including the spring game. So we'll be there to cover it for you guys. Myself, Jordan Hoppeditz, Kevin Longquist. We've got you covered at OnThePonyExpress.com, so wanted to get you guys a little podcast, had a chat with Andy Staples. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hit the subscribe button to wherever you check out our podcast. Share them. Share on ThePonyExpress.com. Hope you guys have a great weekend, and we will catch you guys next time with another edition of the On The Pony Express podcast. Thanks for listening to the On The Pony Express podcast with Billy Embody. Follow us on your socials on X at SMU on 3 and on Instagram at on 3SMU. And keep it locked to OnThePonyExpress.com for more coverage.